In this question, we've been given a starting value of 80,000 and we're told it's going to increase by 15% per year for three years. So we could perform this calculation three times, but it's a little time consuming and inefficient. What we're going to do instead is put all of the work in into one calculation. So if you increase something by 15%, you bring it up from its original starting value, which we can think of as 100%, to 115%. So we're taking 115% of this starting value, and that's just basically taking 15% and adding it on, which is what we want to do. 115% as a decimal, and these questions working with percentages are all really about uh, turning the percentage into a decimal. That is represented by the decimal 1.15. If it was 105%, it'd be 1.05. If it was 90%, it'd be 0 0.9. So just converting your percentage into a decimal, that's really the starting point. So if we take the original value, 80,000, and we multiply it by 1.15, then that's going to do two things. It's going to calculate 15% uh, of 80,000, and it's going to add it on to the original um, starting value. So it's not just taking 15% of this number, it's taking 15% and adding it on, which is what we want to do. We want to do that three times over three years, but you don't need to repeat the process, you just need to put the, um, the percentage change um, to the power of the time period. In this case, it's the power of three for three years. So this is a classic percentages appreciation, so something increasing in value uh, question. Sometimes these are depreciation, something decreasing, and, and it's just a classic setup. So don't have to do it three times, just have to do that. Obviously, it's a calculator question. So at this point, just taking that value, that calculation, and putting it into your calculator. So let's quickly work that out. So 80,000 times 1.15 uh, to the power of 3. So that comes out to be 121,670. Now, in a question like this, just scan the question, which I've got on a screen over here. Uh, just to check if they're asking for it to be rounded to the nearest 10 or 100. There's nothing like that in this question. So that is the, the final answer for this question. In this question, we've been given this vector P written in component form, and we're asked to find its magnitude. So the magnitude is just the size or the length of a vector. So if you draw a vector as a line segment, if this was our vector P here, then the magnitude is just the length of that line segment. There's no formula on the formula sheet for magnitude, so you do need to commit it to memory. And it basically just says that the magnitude is each of the components uh, squared and added together and then square rooted. So if you had a vector, let's call it vector A, which had components A and B, so a two-dimensional vector, then the magnitude of A represented by the bars on the side of the vector would just be each of the, those components, A and B, squared and added together and then square root. And if that looks familiar, then it should look familiar. It is Pythagoras. It's just working out the long side of a, a right angle triangle. If your vector goes up to three dimensions, this one was two dimensions, our vector is three dimensions, then you just add in the extra components. So if your components were A, B and C, then the magnitude of that vector A is just the square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So a very straightforward uh, formula, just have to commit it to memory. So we're going to get the magnitude of p over here. Remember if you're writing your vectors with lowercase letters, you need to put a little line underneath them. They're meant to be written in bold, but because we can't write in bold, we put a little line segment, uh, sorry, a little line underneath it. So we're just going to go ahead here and set up our formula, which is just using this guy here which is the square root of the components squared added together. So 6 squared plus 27 squared plus negative 18 squared. So negative 18 all squared. So you need to put that in a bracket. Almost always in these questions, they'll include at least one component, which has a negative value to try and lure students into making the classic mistake of writing it as minus 18 squared, which is not correct. You would lose a mark for that. Um, even if you process the number correctly. So it should come out to be a positive. This is a, a calculator question. So obviously these numbers are quite high to do non-calc. So I'm just going to put these values in the calculator. So you could do this all in one go or you could break it down. It's up to you. So 6 squared is 36. 27 squared, 729 apparently. 
and then minus 18 squared, you can just put that on the calculator as 18 squared if you like, because it comes out to be the same value, a positive value. So it's like this. And one thing about these questions, you'd expect the magnitude to be a whole number just by the design of the question. Magnitudes don't have to be whole numbers, but they're normally designed so that they are whole numbers. So if this does not come out to be a whole number uh, when we square root it, then it's probably an indication that something's gone wrong. So we'll check that in a moment. So adding these numbers together gives us 1089. And I'm just going to go ahead and square root that, and we're going to hope it comes out to be a whole number. It does, comes out to be 33, and that is uh, the final answer. So no real magic to those questions, you just basically need to know the formulas. Usually, well, it's only one formula, but usually they're in 3D, so 3D vectors, so 3D, um, three components. It can be in two, it doesn't really matter how many co uh, components you've got, it's just adding in the number of components into the, the formula. So that is the solution for that question. In this question, we've been asked to find the area of this triangle PQR. So it's a non-right triangle, which means that it's a, a general triangle. And we've got a formula for that on the formula sheet. So the formula sheet says that the area of a triangle like that is equal to 1 half AB sine C. Just to think about what that means, well, first of all, it assumes that you've got an ABC triangle, which is sometimes what you've got in the questions, but not always. And uh, usually not. So if we label this one up A, B, and C, so this would be little b here, lowercase a here, lowercase c here. So what this is really saying, if we mark on these, we've got a here, b here, and uppercase c here. What it's really saying is that all you need are two side lengths with the angle in between. Doesn't really matter if it's a, b, and c or any other letters. That's what this formula says. Take two side lengths with the angle in between and multiply that all together. That's exactly what we've got in our question. We've got two side lengths with the angle in between. So we can use this formula directly and we just need to update the letters in our question. So in our question, we don't have A, B and C. So we can say that the area is one half, instead of A and B, we're gonna have Q and R. So one half Q, R, sine of the angle in between those, which is P. Now we're just gonna go ahead and populate the equation, the formula, with our number. So it's one half times Q, which is 45, times R, which is 70, times that to the sine of 129. And at this point, we're almost done, really. We've made the interpretation. It's just a case of putting this into the calculator, which I shall now do. Just make sure you put the numbers into the calculator carefully. It's easy still to make a numerical mistake. So times 45. Okay, so that one comes out to be 1224, just pretty much bang on like 1224, so 1224. The units were centimetres, so the final answer here will be centimetre squared because we are working in area. So that's the answer for that problem. In this question, we've been given the weight of a sesame seed, which is this very small number here, written in a scientific notation. And we're asked to calculate the weight of a poppy seed, which apparently is 8% of the weight of the sesame seed. So really, all, all we're trying to do in this question is to take 8% of this number. And this is a calculator question, thank goodness, so we can just put that into the calculator. So it's a pretty straight up question, really. You just got to remember that 8% I suppose it's bringing in a little bit of percentages as well. 8% as a decimal number is 0 0.08. So that's what we need to use as our multiplier. If you multiply something by 0 0.08, you're basically taking 8% of it. If you multiply it by 1.08, you're taking 8% and adding it on. But we're just working out 8%. So we're going to do this here. And that's normally how we work with percentages. We convert them to their decimal. Be careful not to write that as 0 0.8. Remember that 0, otherwise that would be 80%. So all we're really going to do here is take the number that we're starting with, which is in the um, scientific notation form, so this number here, and we're going to multiply that by 0 0.08, just to do what we've been asked to do in the question, which is to work out 8% of that number. So depending on what type of calculator you're using, there might be a slightly different process. I'm using a phone calculator, but on a, on a normal, on an actual calculator, yeah, you can put this in quite easily into the scientific notation. So we're just putting this straight into the calculator. So 3.6 times 10 to the power of negative six. So 3.6 times 10 to the power of negative six. 
So you don't need to write this in as a decimal number, but just to show you, that comes out to be, so 3.6 times 10 to the negative six. So that comes out to be the number zero point, and then we've got five zero, 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 three, six. So that's why we use the scientific or standard form notation, because otherwise for really small numbers, you've got a bunch of leading zeros, and for really large numbers, you've got a bunch of zeros on the end. So it's just a way of compacting the number of zeros into this decimal, sorry, into this standard form like this. So we don't need to write this number in here. You can just go straight to putting that in the calculator like that and multiplying it to 0 0.08. And it should be that your calculator just presents that in standard form, in scientific notation. My one's not done that. So just to show you, in case it doesn't do it, so one, two, three, four, five, six leading zeros, two, three, four, five, six, and then we've got two, eight, eight. Your calculator probably won't do that. I'll probably go straight to putting it into the correct form, uh, which is fine, and at that point you'll be done. Just remember your units. But just to show you how you'd convert this, so we always write these numbers with a whole number and then some decimal. So in my case, it'll be 2.88. And you're just imagining if the point was there, as it is here, how many jumps would you need to make to get back to there, where it actually is. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this would be times 10 to the power of negative seven. And that's how your calculator probably will present the answer. The units are kilograms, so just remembering your units for that one. These questions tend to be quite easy because you can put them directly into the calculator. You shouldn't have to really work with this form of the number. I've just put that in there for illustration. It should be a case of putting that straight in the calculator and getting this answer out. Depends how your calculator is set up though. Some of them will spit out this number. So it's good to know how to convert this to this manually just in case that comes up. So that is the answer for this question. In this question, we've been asked to write down the coordinates of points A and B. So this is a 3D coordinate question. So notice how the question's worded write down. So any write down or state question, you shouldn't need any working. So in this question, we're just going to use the diagram, which I've got over here, to try and figure out the coordinates of A and B. So we'll just take them one at a time. So the, the super important thing to remember and to know is if you're working in three dimensions, so like this, it's not easy because you're looking at this on a two-dimensional um, screen or a whiteboard in this case but it is meant to be a three-dimensional diagram and that can be a little confusing. The second thing though is, and the more important thing is, that it doesn't go x, y as normal. Y goes back the way and then the z coordinate goes up the way. So the y is going like into the board. It's a dimension that you can't really get a feel for on the 2D image. That's why these questions are a little tricky. So we'll start with point A. So we can see that point A lies on the x-axis. So it's a certain length along this way but it's got no length going back the way, otherwise it would be back here somewhere, and it's got no height up the way either. So that tells us just by inspection of the diagram that the x coordinate will be some value, some distance along the x, which we don't yet know, but the y coordinate and the z coordinate will definitely both be zero. So we can go ahead and write those in. So going back to the diagram, there's always some information in these questions. So they're telling us that the diameter of the cone is six and because point a lies right right in the middle of the kind of circular um, base of the cone then that's going to be halfway along that six so it's going to be three so just by kind of a bit of logic there that is going to be halfway along the six so three and it's difficult to explain that i mean it's just on the diagram you just got to read that off uh, point b lies a certain distance along the way a certain distance back the way and then a certain height the easy one to pick off there is the height because they're telling you that the cone has got a height of eight. Point B is clearly at the top of the cone. So we can get the, the Z coordinate, the vertical coordinate, um, straight off the diagram and that's just gonna be eight. Then we need to work a little harder to get the X and the Y. But you can see that point B is the same distance along the way as point A. They both lie in the middle of the shape going along the way. So it's gonna share the X coordinate with point A. And that's quite often what we do in these questions. We compare one point to another. So it's gonna share that coordinate. So that's gonna be a three. And you can see from the fact that the cone has got a circular base that if point B is three along the way, it's also three back the way. So it's going three 
it's three along this way, it's also three back the way because it lies the same distance back the way as it does along the way. So that tells you the y coordinate is also going to be three. So those are, those are the answers, those are the coordinates. Not a lot of magic in those questions, there's no real technique, you've just got to be very attentive to the diagram. In this question we've been given this quadratic equation and we're asked to solve it and give the answers to one decimal place. So first of all recognise that it is a quadratic equation, you can tell that by the presence of the x squared term. If there was no x squared term it would just be a linear equation which need a completely different method for solution. So if you're trying to solve a quadratic equation you've got two options, you can either factorise it into two brackets or you could use a quadratic formula quadratic formula question is almost always in the calculator paper and you can tell that this one would be the quadratic formula, well for two reasons. One, this wouldn't factorise, if you tried to factorise that you would not find the factors and secondly in the question they're referring to decimal, a decimal place, you wouldn't get decimal places unless you used the quadratic formula. If you did it by factorising you would get whole numbers or very simple uh, fractions. So it tells us that we're going to be using the uh, quadratic formula which is on the formula sheet so you don't need to remember that. So the solutions x are given by minus b plus or minus the square root of the discriminant part b squared minus 4ac, all of that divided by 2a. And remember that that's for the quadratic equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So the a, b and the c values, which are numbers in reality, are just the coefficients of the x squared and the x term and the number term is the c value. So a couple of things I see quite often in students work with this question type. One is to make the fraction stop at the wrong place, so maybe here or maybe pulling it all the way over to the x, so it needs to be exactly there, be careful with that. And watch out for any of the values in here which are negatives, so we can see our c value is negative because that's going to lead to probably a double negative or something like that, so be careful with negatives in this question. So I would recommend explicitly writing down the a, b and the c value, so a equals 3. Remember you've got to look out for the sign, so b is 9, positive 9, the c value is negative 2. A lot of students will write down just 2 but it has to be negative 2. So we can go straight into again our solutions now, so just populating the formula, so minus b is minus 9, plus or minus, remember to retain that plus and minus at this point, the square root of b squared, so it's up to you if you want to write in b squared or if you want to go straight to 81, so I'll just maybe write it in, so b squared is 9 squared minus 4 times the a value which is 3 times the c value which is negative 2, and I'm just going to use brackets there to represent that multiplication, it's quite a neat way to do it. All of that divided by 2 times a is 3, so it's going to be 2 times 3 which is 6, or you could write in 2 times 3. So it is a calculator question, but I would say don't put it in the calculator at this point, develop the numbers a little bit first, otherwise there's just too much scope for making a mistake in the calculator, so keeping this bit, developing the bit under the square root, so 9 squared is 81, this is a double negative, so it's going to be a plus, 4 times 3 is 12, times 2 is 24, so we get this, all of that is still divided by 6. And I would take another line still before you put it in the calculator, so basically you want to have this leading number here, then the plus or minus the square root of one number, so this will be 105, like this, all over um, 6, like that. And then at this point where you've got like number, number, and one number here, then split it off. So you're going to get two solutions, so x equals, the first solution we'll use the plus, from the plus minus, the second one we'll use the minus, so minus 9 plus root 105, so minus 9 plus root 105 divided by 6. They should be easy questions these if you're just careful. The second solution will be almost identical but it'll be minus 9 and we're going to use the minus. This is where the two solutions come from and if you look in the question it says give your answers, like answers plural, so two more than one solution, nine, minus 9 minus 105 and then all of that divided by 6. And then at this stage it's just a case of putting it into the calculator, so let me just quickly uh, compute those, so minus 9 plus square root of 105, dividing that by 6, so that comes out to be 0 
Eight, you might want to write that to you know, several decimal places, even though the question's only asking for one, and then, then write your answer, which will be 0 0.2 to the number of decimal places. So that's 0 0.2 to, uh, to one uh, decimal place. Just doing the same thing for the other calculation. So nine, uh, minus nine, minus the square root of 105, dividing that by six. So this one comes out to be negative 3.2078. There's never any necessarily gonna be a, a sort of correlation between these numbers. It can be random. Quite often one's positive and one's negative, but that doesn't have to be the case. So there's no way to kind of check if these numbers are correct. And then again, just rounding this to uh, one decimal place, so minus 3.2. And that's to, again, to one uh, decimal place. So very process-driven procedural questions. Really, you just got to be careful with the working, careful with the numeracy, and you should be fine with that one. In this question, we've been asked to find the smallest angle in this XYZ triangle. So it's a non-right angle triangle, so we're going to be using either the sine or the cosine rule. First thing is to identify which it is actually the smallest angle. So I think just visually you can see that this one here is the one that we're trying to find. So that, that's really important just to make sure you actually know what it is you're trying to find. So it's an XYZ triangle with the formulas for the sine and the cosine rule on the formula sheet are written in A, B and C. So you do need a little bit of adapting, uh, which is quite typical in these question types. So the first challenge then is which rule are we going to use? Are we going to use the sine rule or the cosine rule? That's always a challenge in these questions. You can start working up one of the rules and you'll quite quickly discover that it won't work, but there are criteria to be more uh, refined in the way you go about that. For example, if you're using the cosine rule to find an angle, so in the formula sheet that says cos A equals uh, B squared plus C squared, minus a squared over 2bc. Notice that the criteria basically to use that formula for finding an angle is to have all three side lengths, which is what we've got in this question. If you tried to use the sine rule, it wouldn't work because to use the sine rule to find an angle, you would need at least one other angle because the sine rule has to be in pairs. So that would be like a pair and you would need a side length and its corresponding angle pair. You don't have that. So that tells us kind of by process of elimination that we're gonna to have to use the cosine rule. There's different ways to adapt these questions. So the cosine rule, like I say, is written in A, B, and C. We're using a different lettering system on this triangle. So there's different ways to handle it, but I would, um, I would recommend either relabeling your diagram, which some people do, or just relabeling the equation. So making it cause of whatever angle you're trying to find. And notice that if that's a, an A there, that's a little A there. So our little Z is going to go on the end like that. And the other two letters don't really matter. So just putting them in alphabetical order. So I'll just go um, X squared plus Y squared. Because when you're adding things together or multiplying them, the order doesn't matter. So just putting them in alphabetical order really. But the key is that they need to match up. Okay, they need to match up. And then whatever goes there, goes there. So it's quite easy to adapt the formula. You don't really need to redraw the diagram. Um, I think that's kind of overkill, to be honest. So let's have a go at uh, using this version, putting the numbers in, first of all. So really just populating the equation. This is little x down here. So remember, this is little x, this is little y, and this is little z. So little x is 7.2. So that's going to be 7.2 squared. Just being careful with the numeracy plus the y, which is 8.5 squared, minus the z, which is 6.3 squared. Even just populating the formula, like you're choosing the correct formula and populating it, you're going to start to get, in for, uh, get marks. So the x is 7.2 times the y, which is 8.5. And then it's just a case of putting this into the calculator carefully. Remember, we're trying to find an angle, so we're going to be using the inverse cosine later on. So when we, put, when we calculate this, it should come out to be a decimal number, like zero point something, and then we'll use the inverse. So you can put this all in the calculator in one go, that's fine, or you can break it down. Whichever way you're going to do it, just do it carefully. I see a lot of just numerously mistakes in these questions. Okay, so just churning through the work, and I'm going to do it in stages. So I've worked out the top line um, first. So the top line here comes out to be 84.4. You don't have to do that. You can put this all in the calculator in one go. It just depends how you feel about that. 
I'm just going to separate it out. That's partly because I'm using a phone calculator, which is not quite as convenient as an actual calculator. So this comes out to be 122.4. I'm just going to go ahead and divide those. So we've got 84.4 divided by 122.4. That comes out to be 0. Point, and I, I use quite a few decimal places here. 6, 8, 9, 5, 4. And that keeps going on forever. So you can do like dot, dot, dot. So that's cos z, right? So we're still working with cos z at this point. At this point, it might be useful to predict what you think the answer might come out to be because it will help you check whether you've kind of got the working right. So this is close to half of a right angle, isn't it? So a right angle would be to there, it's somewhere in the middle. So somewhere in the ballpark of 45 degrees. So we're going to get our z by doing cos inverse of this number. So zero point. And again, make sure you use at least sort of four decimal places here. Otherwise, it will throw the final answer off. So taking the inverse of that, so it comes out to be 46.4 degrees. So 46.4 degrees, which is close to our guesstimate, so we're happy with that answer. So signing cosine rule questions, they're not easy, but the key is to make sure that you get really focused on which rule to use. If you pick out the wrong rule, if we picked out the sign rule there, by the time we get to maybe the second line of work, and it'll be obvious that we don't have enough information, and we have to abandon that rule and then use the other one. Once you pick out the correct one, then just populating the formula really carefully and just being careful with the numeracy. So that's the answer for that question. Remember your degrees because it was an angle, so 46.4 degrees. In this question, we've been asked to make the volume of this shape. So as is typical in these questions, it's a composite shape, which means that it's basically two shapes stuck together. In this case, we've got a cylinder, which does not have a formula in the formula sheet. You need to commit that one to memory. Um, we've got a hemisphere, which is just half of a sphere. We don't have a hemisphere formula in the formula sheet. We've got a sphere formula, and we could just half our answer to get half of a sphere or a hemisphere. So we need to do these um, separately. Let's maybe start with the, the hemisphere. So um, I'll just label that. So we're starting with the, the hemisphere. It doesn't really matter which one you do first. So to get the hemisphere, we're just going to half the answer for the sphere. So the volume is on the formula sheet for a sphere, and it's 4 thirds pi r uh, cubed. 4 thirds pi r cubed. We're going to half that though, so I'm just going to write in additionally one half uh, times that. Okay, so it's, it's quite common to see hemispheres in these questions, so it's just working out the sphere um, volume and then halving it. So we're just going to populate our formula, so the 4 thirds stays, that's a constant. Pi is just the number pi. We just need to figure out the radius. They generally don't give you the radius in a question like this. They'll give you other information or maybe the diameter. So in this case, this is our hemisphere up here. We don't have any dimensions up here, but this 24 is the same dimension as would be uh, up here. So in other words, the 24 is the diameter of the sphere or the hemisphere. So we're going to half that to get a radius. So 24 halved is 1. Um, sorry, it's not 1, it's uh, 12. So that's going to be 12 cubed. And then we just need to carefully calculate uh, that number. Okay, so 1 half times 4 thirds pi r cubed. So very much a, a calculator question, so just putting this number carefully into the calculator. So you can put numbers like this all in in one go. Uh, just be careful if you're doing that. Some people like to break them down like number by number. So times... Okay, so I'm using a phone calculator, probably a normal actual calculator, it's a bit easy, a bit easier. So we've got 3619, and the answer is talking about three significant figures, so we're fine to leave that number like that. We don't need the decimal places, really. There are some decimal places, but that would be fine for what we'll need later on. If you want to write in the decimals here just to show that sort of working, that's fine. Maybe just use um, two or three decimal points like that. So that's our hemisphere, so we can move on and go to the other shape, part of the shape, which is a cylinder. So the formula for a cylinder, like I said earlier, is not on the formula sheet. It's basically an example of a prism, and a prism has a volume equal to the area of the base 
part. So if you imagine the base part here of the prism being a circle, the area of a circle is pi r squared times the length of the prism. So it means basically that the volume here is pi r squared to the base times the height, which is h of pi r squared h. Slight challenge with this question is that the h would just be from there to there. But we've got the 70 going all the way to the very top of the shape, including the uh, hemisphere. But we know that the extra bit, the bit that we don't want, that's just the radius of the hemisphere. So that means that we can get the height of our cylinder by doing 70 minus the radius of the hemisphere, uh, which was uh, 12. So our h here, our h value for, for this part is going to be 70 minus 12, uh, which is uh, 58. So we can just plug that number in and we can say that the volume is pi times the, the radius. So the radius, remember, is 12, uh, not 24. So 12 squared multiplied to the h, which is a 70 minus 12. So it's going to be 58. And then just carefully, again, calculating that on the calculator. So we always tend to assume that once we get the calculator in our hand, that it's all good. But sometimes, you know, it's easy to make little slips on the calculator, so still be careful with that part of the process. So, mm, that seems a little big, I'm just going to check that again. Times 58. It's quite difficult in volume questions to know whether the answer makes sense or not. So this one does seem like quite a big number, but it's difficult to gauge, and the, and the numbers are fairly large on the diagram, so volume numbers can be quite big. So this one comes out to be 26,238.58. So the total volume is just going to be these guys added together. Volume questions generally will require you to make two volumes and then add them together. They're normally four or five mark questions. So just adding these together, so three, six, you could write this in, I suppose. You could write, so 3619. I think we're fine to drop the decimal points at this, case, at this point. Uh, because the answer is being requested in three significant figures, we won't need to worry about the decimals. So 3619 plus 26238. So that comes out to be 29,857. We want it to three significant figures, so we're counting in one, two, three, and then rounding up uh, from there. So basically, these are the, you know, these are the hundreds. So we're basically saying, what is it to the nearest hundred? To the nearest hundred, it would be twenty nine thousand nine hundred, because we're rounding up because of the next number. And the units here were centimeters. We're working on volume, so it's going to be twenty nine thousand nine hundred centimeters cubed. So not easy, quite time consuming those volume questions, but you've just got to be really careful with the, the numeracy and watch out for them giving you radius when you need diameter or diameter when you need radius. That's quite typical in these question types. In this question, we're being told that Georgie has paid 97785, but that includes a 2.5% charge for late payment. So this is a classic reverse percentages question. So this number here represents 102.5% because she's paid an extra 2.5%. And what we're trying to do in this question initially is to find the 100% value, the value she would have paid if she didn't have that 2.5% charge. So probably the best way to set these up is to say that the 97785, that represents 102 0.5% uh, like this. And then what we eventually want to do is to get down to 100%. So usually the way we do this is to take this down initially to 1%. And we're just going to achieve that by dividing the side of our little equation here by 102.5. As long as we do that to both sides, so we'll divide over here by 102.5 as well. So this is, this is very much a calculator question like pretty much all percentages are. So on the left hand side, we're going to have 977.85 divided by 102.5. That's going to take us down to 9.54. So 1% of the value is 9.54. And now we just want to multiply both sides of our equation by 100%. And this isn't the only way to lay these questions out. There's a, a bunch of different ways you can do it. This is a nice logical way to take it down to 1% and 
and then get up to 100% or whatever value you're looking for, but usually 100%. And the key really is to make that original association and that depends on whether it's a, an increase or a decrease in the value. So this one was an increase, so it's 102.5, which is 100 plus 2.5 rather than taking it away from 100. So we're just now multiplying this number by 100. So that comes out to be 954. So this question you've got to be a little bit careful with because that looks like it maybe could be the final answer. That's how much she would have paid if she had paid on time without the 2.5% charge. But if you notice a word in the question, it says how much would she have saved, not how much would have originally cost. So this is how much she paid. This is how much it would have cost, 954, if she had paid it on time. So how much she would have saved is the difference between these numbers. So she would have saved 9 seven seven point eight five minus nine hundred and fifty four so just popping that in the calculator so nine seven seven point eight five minus nine five four so she would have saved twenty three pounds and eighty five pence so that's kind of an add-on to that question it's not often you've got to make that comparison between the original or the given value and the other value. Normally we just stop at that point, but this part is classic reverse percentage uh, technique. Comes up most years, so it's definitely worth being familiar with how that process works. In this question, we've been asked to write this quadratic expression, this trinomial in completed square form. So it's just an algebraic technique that you just need to commit to memory. There's no way to really figure this out on the fly. It's a very straightforward process, should just be a one step process. You don't need to elaborate this over multiple lines of working. So we're trying to put this in a bracket where we've got x plus or minus some number and then in the bracket all squared. The way you get the inside number is you just half the coefficient of the x term. So the number in front of the x term, which is a plus 10 here, so keeping the sign, so it'll be a plus 5. If it had been a minus 10, then we would use a minus 5, but you always do that, just always half that number in the bracket. Once that number goes in the bracket, take that number and in your head square it. So 5 squared is 25. This means that the bracket here, if we multiplied it out, if we expanded that bracket by multiplying it to itself because it's being squared, the number term we would get would be a 25. We don't want 25, we want minus 15. So you've got to think, well, what is the difference between 25 to minus 15. What would you need to take away from 25 to get to minus 15? And the answer to that is minus 40. And that is the question done. There is an alternative method, which I'll quickly show you. So some students prefer to do this. It's absolutely fine if you want to do this. It's a little bit more working, but just a tiny amount. So the process would always start the same way by half in the coefficient of the x term. So x plus 5 in the bracket squared. What some students will then do is subtract off the number they've just put in the bracket squared. So minus 5 squared, which is minus 25, and then leave that number on the end, this number on the end, so minus 15. That works as well, that's absolutely fine. It just means a second line of working where you then combine the two end numbers like this, and you can see that's still going to go to minus 40. So a couple of different methods. There are other methods, but this one's already a little bit elaborate for my liking. It should really just be a one step. This should be the most working that you ever do. Anyway, those are the solutions or the one solution for that problem. In this question, we're given this diagram, this shape, the triangle, and we're told that it's got a bit of context, it's got a story behind it, and the story is that this is the the, the track for a jet ski race. So we are being asked whether point B is due east of point A, and we're told that point C is due north of point B. So in other words, point C and B are directly above and below each other. So imagine like a compass going like north to south and east to west. So this would be the, the vertical. And we're asked, do these guys basically make a horizontal? If they do make a horizontal, then that would mean that this has to be a right angle in here. So essentially this question is asking, is it a right angle triangle? If it is a right angle triangle, given that that goes straight up and down, then it has to be that, that it goes exactly east to west, and that would answer the question um, as yes, they are east and west. If it's not a right angle triangle, then they can't be east and west of each other if that is north and south. 
So how do we find whether or not it's a right angle triangle? Well, we use Pythagoras, and in particular, we use the converse of Pythagoras. To use the converse of Pythagoras, we need all three side lengths of the triangle, which we don't have, but we are told that the total track length is 1500 meters. So we can see that if that's 600 and that's 650, then this has to be the difference between 1500 and 600 and 650. So we can say, so if we call this um, side over here little a, we can say the little a is going to be 1500 minus 600 minus 650. And just quickly performing that calculation would give you 250. So this side length here is 250 meters. Now we want to do the converse part, which is when we're using the Pythagoras equation to determine whether the triangle is right angled or not. We're not trying to find a side length, we're trying to show whether the triangle is a right angle. So to do that, we're going to take the two short sides and square them and add them together. So we're going to do 250 squared plus 600 squared. And don't make that equal to 650 squared because the whole point is we don't know if it's equal. That's what we're trying to establish in the question. So just go ahead and make this calculation first. So 250 squared plus 600 squared. So it's quite big numbers in this question. So that comes out to be 422. 500. Separately do 650 squared. So 650 squared. Again, doing this on the calculator, obviously. So that's 422. Let me just check that. 650 squared. So that's 422. Five hundred. So they've come out to be the same number. So that tells us then that this is a right, tri right angle triangle. So you can say something like, um, since you've got to make some kind of statement on these, so since 250 squared plus 600 squared equals 650 squared, then the triangle is right angled. And you've got to make a reference in these questions to the converse of Pythagoras. So it's right angled by the converse of Pythagoras's theorem, which I'm just going to abbreviate to converse of Pythagoras's theorem. You'd probably get away with writing that. If not, maybe just write the whole thing. So converse of Pythagoras's theorem. But you need that statement in there. You need that reference to Pythagoras's theorem to get the marks. So a pretty typical question really, they come up quite often, these ones with the converse. They're not easy to recognise though, that's the thing. So if you're ever asked about due east or due west, or whether something is you know, potentially going to be a right angle triangle, it's going to be a converse of Pythagoras question. In this question we've been given these two sectors and we're told that they are mathematically similar. So if you see the term mathematically similar, that means it's going to be a similar shapes question, the one that involves scale factors. So that should be your clue as to how you're going to go about solving this. So we're told that the larger shape has got an area of 2750. So I'm just going to go ahead and write that in. So it's 2750 and it's an area, so it's centimetres uh, squared. And we're asked in the first part of the question to figure out the area um, of the smaller sector. So this is really just a, a sort of classic um, similar shapes problem. So you're using these two sides, which are the same side, the corresponding side on each of the shapes, to get your scale factor. And the scale factor depends on whether you're making an enlargement or a reduction. So we're making a reduction here because we're going from the big shape to the smaller, and that tells you which way around your scale factor is going to be. So we're going to start by making the linear scale factor, the one that compares lengths, and we can do that because we've got two lengths here. So there's different ways to think about this, but one useful way is a little formula called the new over the old. And the new over the old means that the one you're trying to find, you would label that as the new shape, and the one that you've got the information about, because we've got the information of the area of the shape, is the old shape. And the new over old would mean, in our case, 30 divided by 50. So it's easy to get those muddled, so the wrong way around. So we want 30 divided by 50. It could be if you get those the wrong way around, that would be uh, 50 divided by 30, and it goes the wrong way. So that's our linear scale factor. So we could at this point, I suppose, um, it's a calculator question. We could go ahead and just put that in the calculator. We're not 
Um, we're a long ways from being done, but just to get maybe that number simplified, so that comes out to be 0 0.6. The question though is not to do with linear, it's not to do with the comparison of lengths, it's to do with areas. It's the area we're trying to find, so that means we need to make the area scale factor. So the area scale factor is just the linear scale factor squared. The linear scale factor is 0 0.6, so it's going to be 0 0.6 squared, so that comes out to be 0 0.36. So what does this tell us? Well, the linear scale factor tells us that the you would need to multiply this by 0 0.6 to get that, and the area scale factor tells us you would need to multiply this by 0 0.36 to get this, and this is what we're trying to find. So we can then say that the area that we're trying to find is equal to 2750 times the area scale factor, how much we're reducing it by, which is 0 0.36, and then just put that carefully into the calculator, which I shall do now, times 2750, <coughs> and that comes out to be 990. So the units here are centimetres as an area, so it's going to be centimetres squared. So pretty typical um, scale factor question, that one. Part B of the question is completely different. Part B is asking us to find or to calculate the size of the angle ACB. So ACB, first of all, just make sure you know what angle that is. A to C to B, it's the one in the middle. So we're trying to calculate that um, shaded area, uh, sorry, shaded um, angle in there. So how are we going to do this? Well, this is a sector. So the fact that it's a sector should give you a clue. It's not an easy question though. Um, but basically we've got a formula for the sector area, so we can say that the sector, and this is not on the formula sheet, you do need to commit it to memory, so the sector is equal to the, to the angle, whatever angle we've got in here, the one that we're trying to find in this case, uh, divided by 360, so that tells you the, the ratio of the circle, so we're not, we don't have the whole circle, we've just got this angle out of 360, times for sector area pi r squared, and if that was arc length it would be pi d, sector area is pi r squared, because that pi r squared, that is a formula for the area of a complete circle. So complete circle, pi r squared, we're taking pi r squared and multiplying it by this ratio to get only this part of the circle. So we r50 here is the, uh, the radius, so we can go ahead and start to put that in. You might just want to allocate some letter here to the angle, maybe A or X or something. I'll use an X, so X over 360. And remember that we already know the sector area. We know the area of this shape is 2750. So we can put the 2750 on the left hand side here. So just populating all the information in our formula. And we're multiplying this by pi times the radius, which is 50 squared. So even getting to that point, you would already be generating marks. And now what we're essentially trying to do is to solve this equation for x, which is not easy. And students tend to find the algebra and the rearrangement here quite challenging. We're trying to find this angle, so we're trying to solve it for x. So uh, one thing you can do, which I think makes it a little easier, is to group all these terms together. So um, we've got pi times 50 squared. I might actually just... Um, go ahead and do the 50 squared. So 50 squared is 2500. 0, 2500 0, 0 times pi is 2500 0, 0 pi. And we're multiplying that to the x. So bringing these all together, it looks like this over 360. And then we've got 2750 here. There's different ways to go about these questions. How you go about the algebra will be a little bit of personal preference and personal style. You might find that useful to bring these together. Bear in mind we're trying to solve for x. Now we just want to move these terms to the other side. So the 360 needs to multiply on the other side and the 2500 pi needs to divide. So doing the opposite on the other side of the equation. So that would mean that eventually you're going to get x equals 2750 multiplied by 360 and then all of that divided by 25. 0, 0, pi. And hopefully that should all, then all compute to give us a reasonable answer. So looking at this angle here, we can see it's, what is it, maybe just a bit bigger than a right angle. So we've got it in the ballpark of somewhere between 90 and 180 degrees. If it comes out to be anything outside that, then we'll know we've done it wrong. Putting this in the calculator really carefully, because it is a little 
fiddly and there's quite a few numbers. Okay, so that's come out to be 126 uh, degrees. So I think that looks reasonable based on the, on the diagram. So not an easy question that to interpret in the first case. Once you even do realize it's a sector area formula question, then getting the information populated and rearranging the formula for X is still not easy. So that is the answer for that one, but it is a tricky little question. In this question, we've been given these two points, A and B, and we're asked to make an expression for the gradient. So first of all, notice the word in that question, an expression for the gradient. The gradient's normally a number, not an expression, but it's gonna be an expression this time because point B has not got numerical uh, coordinates. It's been given as algebraic um, terms. So we're just gonna make the gradient in the, in the usual way, and that is to use the, the gradient formula, which is the um, y2 minus y1, so that's uh, the vertical change divided by x2 minus x1, the, the horizontal change, so vertical over horizontal, or just using the points. If you're gonna use the points, it's good practice to, to label your points, so I could make this x1 and y1, and then x2 and uh, y2. And then it's just a case of subbing these into the uh, gradient equation. It's the interpretation, I think, of this question that's challenging because of this weird looking point but trying not to get too sucked into that, just do the same thing you'd always do to make the gradient. So y2 is 4p squared, so that's gonna be 4p squared uh, minus y1, which is nine, divided by x2, which is 4p, minus x1, which is six. So at that point, we've already sort of achieved what we've been asked to do, which is to make an expression for the gradient. This is an expression. We just need to simplify it now. So this is no longer really a straight line gradient question. This is now a algebraic fraction question because these are, this is an algebraic fraction. These are algebraic terms. To achieve this, we're going to factorize. This is how you simplify uh, one single algebraic fraction. So this top line here factorizes as a difference of two squares. So that's gonna need two brackets. So we'll need a 2p and a 2p, and a three and a three, and one plus and one minus. Doesn't matter if you go plus minus or minus plus. And then we can factorize the bottom line using a common factor of two. So it'll be two outside the bracket, and then 2p minus three inside the bracket. Should always be the case for these that you end up with a bracket top and bottom which matches up. So we're gonna divide top and bottom by 2p minus three, but the, the net effect of that is just that these are gonna basically disappear and we're just left with 2p plus three on the top. You could drop the bracket now if you wish, um, divided by two on the bottom. So that is the answer for that problem. In this question, we've been asked to solve this trigonometric equation. So it's really just a straight up trigonometric equation. There's no context, there's no magic. You just need to know the technique. So we start these by rearranging to get the trig term, the cos x in this case, on its own, and the other num uh, the numbers on the other side. So we're gonna take the minus two to the, uh, the two to the other side to make a minus two. So it's gonna be one minus two uh, to give us minus one. And then we're gonna divide both sides by five so that's gonna become minus one over five. So at this point, you really need your uh, cast diagram just to predict where the solutions are gonna be. Remember that the, the range of values that's given in the question doesn't play a huge part because at nat five, almost all of them are zero to 360. In fact, they all are. So it just tells us really that we're only allowed solutions between zero and 360, which is one cycle um, of the cast diagram. So the cast diagram, uh, hopefully you're familiar with this, goes like this. You don't get marks for the cast diagram, but it's quite difficult to do these questions without it, um, especially for the, the second solutions, but sometimes for both solutions. So that's a fully marked up cast diagram. So we've got here a cosine and a negative value. So all that we care about in the cast diagram is whether this is positive or negative. Cosine negative, well, cosine positive would be here and here cosine quadrant and the all positive quadrant. Because it's negative, it'll be the other two. So we're putting a check here and here. So it means that we're looking for solutions between 90 and 180 and between 180 and 270. So we need to take the inverse. So we're gonna do cos inverse. But remember that if it's a negative, you drop the negative in the inverse. So cos inverse of just one over five. This is a calculator question. So just putting this carefully into the calculator. 
So that comes out to be 78.46 degrees. So notice that 78.46 is here in the first quadrant. The calculator always gives you an answer in the first quadrant if this is a positive value. And that's just a reference an uh, answer, an angle. It's not the final answer. The final answers are these two. So to get this one here, we're going to do 180 minus this number. To get this one, 180 plus. And these are our two x solutions. So we can assign those to x at this point. So 180 minus 78.46. Just quickly go ahead and calculate that. So 180 minus 78.46. So that comes out to be 101.5, probably just one decimal place is fine for an angle, so degrees. The second one, the one which is in the T quadrant, that's going to be 180 plus 78.46. So 180 plus 78.46, could probably do that without a calculator, but hey, got the calculator, so may as well use it. So that's 258.46. Or six degrees, or maybe just point, um, maybe just make that 258.5 degrees to go to one decimal place. So these are our two solutions. Pretty straight up trig equation, that one. The only thing that makes it more difficult is the negative. The ones with the negatives don't get any more marks, but they are more challenging. Be careful about marking up the cast diagram and making two adjustments rather than just one, as is the case when that's a positive value. So those are the two solutions to that equation. In this question, we've been asked to express these two algebraic fractions as a single fraction. In other words, we've been asked to combine them, or another, another way of thinking of that is just taking this fraction away from that one. So, pretty typical algebraic fraction question. Like all fractions, if you're going to add or subtract them, you need to make a common denominator. So, the common denominator you get by multiplying the two original denominators. So, we're basically in the first step here, just making two new fractions. So don't try and skip beyond that. That should always be the first step. So multiplying these together, we don't actually need to multiply them. We're just going to put them in brackets and sit them next to each other. Because if you sit two um, brackets next to each other, that implies multiplication anyway. We don't need to multiply actually out the brackets. So that is now our common denominator. So that's just by multiplying these two together. And then we need to adjust the numerators by cross multiplying. So this multiplies up to here and this multiplies up to here. So four times this bracket here, so that's going to be four, um, well it's not actually in a bracket, but you can imagine these being in brackets. Sometimes they are written in brackets. So it's going to be four bracket x plus five. So notice that all we've actually done there is taken this fraction and multiplied it top and bottom by x plus five. That's essentially what we're doing. We're multiplying the x minus two up there to the three. So that's going to be three bracket x minus two. And that really just means for that second fraction, we've multiplied it top and bottom by x minus two. And you're always allowed to multiply a fraction top and bottom by the same thing. That just makes an equivalent fraction. So that fraction there and that fraction there are the same. And these two are the same as well, just written in a different way. But the whole point is that now they've got a common denominator so we can combine them. So now we're just going to say uh, four bracket x plus five minus three bracket x minus two, all over one version of the denominator, because they've got a common denominator, we can just combine them now to be like that. So that's a little bit like if you had like, so two, um, two sevenths plus one seventh, you would just make that into three sevenths, right? You wouldn't make it into three fourteenths, it's just three sevenths. So we're just taking these denominators and merging them into one. So we're almost done at this point, we just need to simplify the top line. So multiplying out the brackets, we get four x, plus 20 minus 3 times x, so that's minus 3x, minus 3 times minus 2 is plus 6, so watch out for that double negative, pretty common in these questions, all over x minus 2, x plus 5, and pretty much done now, just combining the like terms, so 4x minus 3x is 1x, or just x, and then 20 plus 6 is 26, and then again, all of that over x minus 2, x plus 5. So it should be a, a technique that you're familiar with. It's a very predictable question, comes up pretty much every year. It's the same technique as if you're working with numerical fractions, if you're adding or subtracting them, just making the common denominators and then combining them. It is a little bit more intimidating with algebraic terms, but this technique essentially is good for both algebraic and numerical fractions. So that is the, the solution for this one. 
In this question, we've been given this slightly ugly looking expression and we're asked to simplify it. So this is an indices question. We're using indices rules here. So the first thing is that the, um, the square root, remember, is the same as a one half power. So you could make that your first move just to change that into a one half power. And that's true for any type of root. So a square root goes to a one half power. But if you had something like, say, a cube root, of a, that would be the equivalent of a one-third power, a fourth root is a one-fourth power, and it goes like that. So we can't really work with a square root, but changing it into its indices and its index form, uh, power form, does work for this question type. So here we've got two terms multiplying together. If they're multiplying, you add the power. So this a, remember, is not an a to the zero, it's a one power. So just sometimes useful to actually write that in to remind you. So combining these, the three will just stay in front, and it's going to be a to the power of 4 plus 1, add in the powers if you're multiplying, so 4 plus 1 is 5, divided by a to the 1 half. Now we're dividing, and the divide rule for indices says to subtract your powers, so it's going to be 3a to the power of 5 minus 1 half. So different ways you could write that, so 5 minus 1 half is as a mixed number, four and a half. you probably would get away with a mixed number, you could make it into a fraction by making the 10... Uh, sorry, the 5 into a 10 over 2 minus 1 over 2, uh, which is 9 over 2. Or you could use the, the decimal equivalent, which is 4.5. So all of those are probably acceptable. It's a little bit awkward to know how to write that. I'm going to maybe go for the fractional power, so 9 over 2. But if you put 4.5 or 4.5, that would be fine as well. So just using several different indices rules there to get that fully simplified. We've been given this slightly odd looking expression and we're asked to simplify it. So this is a trigonometric identities question. They tend to not be very popular. This one in particular I think is a little tricky. Not easy to know how to get started, but basically if you've got a bracket squared, remember that is just a shorthand way of writing the bracket twice. So this really means um, this bracket sine x plus cos x multiplied by itself. So that might be a place to start. There's not really much else you can do in this question other than start like that. And now that we've got two brackets multiplying, we can just multiply them out as normal. Although it is weird, right? Because they're trig terms. We're used to seeing numbers or maybe an X or something in the bracket. So we just have to do this carefully. So sine times sine um, gives us sine squared. So when you write sine or cos squared, you put the two, the squared in the middle. So that's basically that one times that one. That one times this one would give us just a sine x cos x. Okay, nothing you can do other than write those beside each other. Then these two are going to give us another um, sine x cos x, although initially it will be written as cos x sine x. But these are just the same thing. It doesn't matter on the order there. And then finally we've got those going together, which will give us a cos squared x like that. So one thing to notice, the two square terms, you should be familiar with a little trig identity that uses those. It's not easy to remember, but I'm just going to regroup these to pull them together. So when you're adding things, it doesn't matter the order in which you add them. So just reordering to pull those guys together. And then recognizing that these are just the same thing, if we spun that one around, we would just have two of these. So just writing that as 2 um, sine x uh, cos x, uh, like that. Okay, and then these two, um, there's a little trig identity that says sine squared plus cos squared is 1. And that's just a formula, an identity you need to know. It's not on the formula sheet. So these just become a 1. So it just becomes 1 plus 2 sine x at cos x. And that's just basically done at that point. This does actually go further, but not in the Nat 5 course. There's another formula for this. But for Nat 5, that's not in the course, so we'll just finish at that point. So not, not, not an easy question really to know how to get into that one, but that is the, the final answer. In this question, we've been given this diagram that represents a snowman, and we're ultimately being asked to find the, the height of the snowman, which is the distance from point D um, to the top point, which is point C. So this is a very difficult question. It wasn't very popular, understandably, the year this one came up. It's a bit of a notorious question, actually. But let me just go through the working. Um, so generally, um, Pythagoras questions, which is what this one is, are not presented as triangles. They're generally presented as circles. The most common presentation is where you've got a circle 
um, and a chord line and you end up making a sort of right angle triangle in here which is not usually on the original diagram and some variation of that diagram um, is what you end up with in most Pythagoras questions. This one's a little bit different but it is also a Pythagoras question which is not easy to recognise given that you've been given a picture of a snowman and there's no triangles but it is ultimately what we're looking for. So just to break it down a little, how are we going to find this total height? Well, we're not going to do it in one go. We're going to find the height from here, which is um, T, or if we knew the height from here, T to D, plus the height here from C to T, by breaking it down onto these sort of two parts of the diagram, then we could just add those together. But we're told in the question that the diameter of the smaller circle, the head of the uh, snowman, is 15 but the diameter is just from one side of the triangle to the other so we'll add uh, the circle to the other so we already know that this height here c to t so we know that c to t which is the diameter is uh, 15 uh, centimeters so we're kind of in a way sort of halfway there and um, so all, all we need to do now is just to figure out the distance from t uh, to d now, T is the centre of the larger circle, so from the centre to the edge is just the radius. So ultimately, now what we're trying to do is just find the radius of that uh, larger circle. But we don't have much going on in the larger circle. We've got kind of more stuff going on in the smaller circle. And this is the challenge with this question. But if you recognise or remember that the radius doesn't just have to be in that position. The radius is any position in which you've got a line from the center point to the edge of the circle. So if we imagine, yeah, that's a radius, but so is that, and so is that, and so is that, and actually so is that. So if you connect the center point of the big circle to point B, then that is also the radius. So if we could figure out that length there, that is gonna be the same length as that there, because they're both the radius of the big circle. So just to um, kind of put this line in solid, to see that we've got a triangle here, not only a triangle, but by the geometry, a right angle triangle. So I'm just gonna pull that right angle triangle out to make it a little larger, which is quite good practice in these questions. So that would be point T, this here is point S, this is a right angle triangle, and this here is point B. So ultimately we've kind of broken this down now to be able to find the length of B to T which is part of this right angle triangle. But remember, we were told that the diameter of this circle, the small circle is 15, so therefore the radius is half of 15, which is 7.5. But that is the radius there, isn't it? That's the center point to the edge, that's the center point to the edge, they're both the radius. So this here, S to T, is 7.5 centimeters, and this here, S to B, which is a bit big on my diagram, to be honest, but that is also, should be <laughs> 7.5 centimeters. So we've got two sides and we can there, therefore use Pythagoras to find the, the long side. So not easy I know to get to that point but that's where we are. So we could call this um, side little s which is our um, opposite of the big S and we're just going to use the Pythagoras equation. So remember that Pythagoras says the two short sides are squared added together to equal the long side. So these are the two short sides. So if we take 7.5 squared and add to that the other short side at 7.5 squared, that is going to equal the long side, which is S um, squared. Okay, and then let's just actually go ahead and, and start to work that up. So this is obviously a calculator question, so you could work that up at this point. So 7.5 7 squared, and we've got two of those. So this comes out to be 100. I'm just going to spin this around, actually, to write it as S squared over here. This part here, the 7.5 squared plus 7.5 squared, is 112.5. And then if we just go ahead and square root that, so S equals the square root of 112.5. And that comes out to be um, 10.6 at uh, one decimal place uh, centimeters. And that looks pretty reasonable, doesn't it? 7.5, 7.5, this could be, uh, just by logic, you know, looking at the diagram, it could be 10.6. So just trying to piece it all together now, what have we just established? Well, we've established that this here, this side is 10.6. But because that side is the radius of the big circle, it means that this side here is also 10.6 centimeters. So we figured out here that um, 
B to T, so let me just maybe write this, so B to T equals 10.6 centimetres, and that implies then that T to D, so T to D, also equals 10.6 centimetres. Ultimately we're trying to find C to D, so now we can sort of piece it all together and say that C to D is going to be C to T, C to T plus T to D. So lots of letters going on here, not easy to keep track of it. We already know C to T, it's here to here, which is the diameter of the small circle. So that's 15 centimetres. We've just worked out T to D to be 10.6 centimetres. Add in those together and we get 25.6 centimetres. So that's the final, the final answer. Not an easy question, not easy to recognise what type of question it is. And understandably, most students find that question a little mm, challenging and a bit annoying. But anyway, that is the answer for that one. In this question, we've been given this non-right angle triangle, and we're told that point B represents the, the position of a hot air balloon above the ground. The ground is here. This is uh, Katie, I think it was, and this is Mona, so two observers on the ground. And we're trying to figure out the height of the hot air balloon based on the information. So the first thing I would say about this question, notice that it's a five marker, and generally at National 5, five mark questions require multiple processes. So it's not going to be a case of using one rule, it's probably going to be a case of using two different rules, two different techniques, and then pulling them together. So five mark questions tend to be like that. So keep that in the back of your mind with a question like this. So we're trying to figure out the height here, so the vertical height. So if you imagine I could actually just draw a line on there. So that line's going to come down there. It's going to meet the ground at a right angle, so just keep that in mind as well. So this um, triangle, this height here, sorry, is part of both this triangle and this triangle. So ultimately, if we're trying to find that height, we need to use one of those triangles. We can't use the big triangle to find our height because the height is not part of that triangle. This big triangle has got that side, that side, and that side. It doesn't include that. So we have to eventually make a second triangle. So we could use this diagram or maybe pull it off into a separate diagram. I'm going to use a separate diagram, and I don't think it matters if you focus on this triangle or this one, but ultimately we need to use one of these two to get this height. So I'm just going to quickly redraw my left triangle, this one here. So starting up at point B, down to point K, and let's just maybe call this something like G for the, for the ground point. And this is just a sketch, of course, doesn't have to be like too accurate. So that, remember, is going to be a right angle triangle. And we've still got the 52 degrees in there, and this would be point G, and this would be point K, and this would be point B. So ultimately, it's this side here of this triangle that we're trying to find. So it's a right angle triangle, but we're going to be um, not using Pythagoras in this one because we don't have enough information. Um, so we're going to therefore be using the sine or the cosine rule. That's the only option if it's not going to be Pythagoras. But at the moment, we don't have enough information to use either of those rules. We don't know anything about this length here because that point there is not in the middle of the 350. The 350 goes from here um, over to here. But we don't know that that point is in the middle. In fact, you can clearly see by the angles that it's not in the middle. They would need to be the same angle. So we can't just transfer some number down here. So the only thing we can really do to get started is to use the big triangle. But let's just think about the strategy for a moment. So if we were able to use the big triangle, we could find this side or this side using the sine rule. So if we find this side here, which is this side down here, then that would give us enough information to then use the sine rule again a second time on this triangle to find this side here. So not easy to piece that all together. So let's start by using the sine rule on the big triangle. So we're kind of ignoring the vertical line at this point. We're going to try and use it to find this point. So the, the vertices here, the corners are B, M and K. So just setting up your sine rule um, as uh, little b, so using the appropriate letters. So little b over sine uppercase b. And then just using them in any order you wish. So I'll go for K next over sine K and then equals m uh, over sine m. And remember with the, the sine rule, you're only using two out of the three. So we want to find this side. This side is little m, this side is little k, and the long side is little b. So it's getting a little bit busy on our, our diagram there, so you've got to keep uh, 
keep an eye on where you are. So we want to use um, this side, the M, because we need to find the M, and we want to use this side, G, um, B, sorry, because that's the side that we've actually got a measurement for. So um, we're going to be using B, this one, and we're going to be using the M, and we can discard the K um, in this case. So starting to now populate the information, so little b is this side length here, so that's going to be 350 over the sine of b. We don't have angle b, um, but you can make angle b, which is going to be the angle here, just by doing 180 minus this guy minus this guy. So that's going to be, let me just quickly check that, that's 80... Six, so that's going to be um, 102. No, it's not going to be 102, it's going to be 94, isn't it? <laughs> so that angle in there, angle B, is 94. So let me just show you where that came from. So that's 180 minus, so this is obviously one big triangle, so it's going to be 180 minus the two angles we've already got, 52 and uh, 34. Uh, to give you the, the final angle, which is uh, 94, the third angle, so that's 94 degrees. So that means that B is going to be 94 degrees, so we can put that into there, and that equals, we're discarding the Ks, remember, so we're going to go into the Ms. The little M is what we're trying to find, so we're going to leave that, and we've got angle M there, so it's going to be the sine of uh, 34 degrees. So we're trying to solve this for M, so we need to move the sine 34 away from the M to get the M on its own. And if we do that, we would end up with, I'm just going to put it here, we would end up with M equals, we're cross multiplying the sine 34 over here, so it ends up on the top. So it's going to be 350 times sine 34. And you can just write that as 350 sine 34 uh, degrees divided by sine 94. So it's not an easy question this, right? There's a lot of stuff going on um, and you've just got to be really, really attentive to all of the working. So it's just a case of putting that in the calculator now and hoping that we get an answer which comes out to be something that makes sense in the context of the question. So that side, side is 350. This one's clearly shorter, maybe roughly half, maybe a little bit more than half. So we'll just keep that in mind as you're putting the, the numbers in the calculator. So we're doing 34 sine Okay, so that comes out to be a pretty good looking number, I think. So 196, and I think this question is in metres, so 196 metres. So that's for this side here. So we now know that side M is 196 metres. We can then transfer that down to our second diagram, so we've got 196 metres here as well. Okay, so we're now working with this uh, smaller triangle to try and find this side, which is ultimately what we're trying to find. So we can just get this one fully labelled up, so that's going to be B, this is going to be a little K, and I've introduced this letter G for this point here, so this is going to be a little G over here. We're trying to find a little K, so we definitely need to, to use um, that side. And let's just maybe start to work up the, the sign rule again, so B, G and K, so we'll go for little G over sine D, uh, G. The order for these doesn't really matter, but generally putting them in alphabetical order, I suppose, but it doesn't really matter which way around you do it. So then we've got B over sine B equals uh, K over sine K. Okay, and let's just think again about what we need. So we need to find the Ks, the K, so we're keeping the Ks. We've got a measurement on the G, so we'll be using the Gs. In fact, we've got the angle as well, so we don't need the B. So we're kind of getting rid of the B's this time and we're keeping the, the G's and the K's. Then just populating our equation, so we get uh, little g is this side length over here, so that's 196, divided by the sine of angle G, which is 90 degrees, and that equals little k, which we're just keeping because that's what we're trying to find, over the sine of k, which is the sine of uh, 52 degrees. So it's an identical process to what we did up here, and that's why I was saying at the start that these five mark questions at NAT5 generally require you to run a process twice. So we've done it once up here, we've then used this answer, the 196 in here, and we're just going to do the same thing again. So if we were to rearrange this, we would cross multiply the sine 52 up here to get the K on its own. So the K will end up being equal to 196 times sine 52, so just 196 sine 52, and dividing that by sine 90 degrees, 
and then hoping that comes out to be again an answer that makes sense. So this side length here, which is the long side of this triangle, is 196. This side is definitely shorter because it's not the long side, but it's not significantly shorter. So something maybe between 100 and 196, just as a ballpark figure. Good to have a guesstimate in mind for these questions before you put them in the calculator. So just running the calculation carefully, it's very easy to make numerical mistakes with these. Okay, so that comes out to be 154 meters, which is pretty much in the ballpark of what we kind of expected it to be. So not an easy question that, but like I say, uh, look out for those five markers. Quite often they're volume questions or sine and cosine rule, where you've got to basically run a process twice. But that is a challenging question. I think that's why it's the, the final question in the paper.